All right, well, uh, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I've uh, been uh, 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 working uh, actually uh, as an advisor to QCWare for a couple of years, so, uh, 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 but I was very sorry to miss uh, last year's uh, uh, Q2B, so I'm very grateful uh, to be invited to speak here. Uh, I am not grateful to uh, John Preskill for uh, sort of setting the bar for me today, which sort of ridiculously high with his talk yesterday, but uh, I'll, I will build on a lot of what he said, and which uh, you know is the same things that I would have said, but you know, but he said them better. So um, uh, uh, this talk is called "Quantum Supremacy and Its Applications." The exclamation mark is because you might not have guessed that there would be any applications uh, for for quantum supremacy, and and that's something that uh, where our, our understanding is uh, is changing now. Uh, so. Um, uh, Okay, so uh, some of you may have seen uh, just in the past month, uh, uh, Michelle Diakonov uh, 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 pu published an article in IEEE Spectrum uh, arguing that scalable quantum computing is never going to work. Okay, so the entire subject of uh, this conference is a mirage, it's a mass delusion, uh, it's just purely you know, a hype-driven bubble. Uh, uh, you know, and, and yet yesterday someone asked me, you know, so, 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 are you going to talk about Diakonov in your, you know, uh, 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 speech? So, so, all right, fine, here it is. Uh, so, uh, you know, so, so in this article, you know, uh, he, you know and, and he's been uh, making similar arguments for 15 or 20 years, and, you know, there's a number of computer scientists and physicists, uh, many of whom I know, uh, 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 Gil Kalai and others who've been making similar arguments. Uh, now, in this article, uh, uh, Diakonov, uh, you know, makes some claims like that, that quantum fault tolerance, you know, uh, doesn't take account of uh, uh, miscalibration of the gates, and incredibly, no one in quantum computing has ever thought about that issue, right? And I read that, and I was like, oh, shoot, how could we have missed that, you know? Uh, I mean, so, you know, he makes some claims that are just flat-out ridiculous, and, and, you know, could be corrected by cracking open any textbook, okay? But, uh, you know, on the broader point, uh, you know, when he says that the applications of quantum computing have sometimes been grotesquely overhyped. Well, he's right about that. When he says that, uh, you know, there's, you know, it, 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 it's not clear if it's going to work, and, you know, some people thought that it already would be scaling, and it's taking longer than those people thought. Well, he's right about that, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, with any new technology, right, I mean, you know, sometimes the pessimists are right, you know, and uh, uh, we should, you know, we, we'd, we'd better listen to them. Uh, and this actually leads me straight into uh, the starting point for my talk today, uh, which, you know, what is this quantum supremacy? Well, this is another term that uh, John coined. You know, he's very, he's been very good at coining terms that sort of distill, uh, uh, you know, uh, major your goals of, of, of our field. Uh, and, you know, th you know th th this one you know, might not have been the uh, optimal choice of word, you know, with the benefit of hindsight. But, uh, oh, okay, uh, th the way that I think about this is, uh, for me personally, the number one goal of, uh, uh, number one application of a, uh, uh, a large-scale quantum computer is not uh, uh, certainly not breaking public key crypto, you know, uh, uh, that's, you know, I mean, that, maybe that's good for whoever does it, that's not good for the world, you know. It's not, it's also not uh, optimization, it's not machine learning, uh, it's not even quantum simulation. It is simply refuting the people like Diakonov, who, you know, you write these articles or they come to my blog and they say that this is never going to work, okay? I want these people to have to confront the full reality of quantum mechanics, and, uh, and, and quantum fault tolerance and, and complexity. Uh, and, you know, if, if you know, uh, uh, against all, you know, everything we understand now, they somehow turned out to be right, well, great, that's even more exciting. You know, that's like, uh, you know, that's a revolution in physics. So, but, you know, I think the uh, idea that uh, ultimately quantum computing can work is the boring possibility. It's the conservative possibility. You know, so it's the, it's the one that we should guess. Uh, and so what quantum supremacy means is just, you know, before even worrying about, you know, is this going to speed up uh, drug discovery? Is this going to speed up uh, financial portfolio optimization? Let's just establish clearly that nature has this computational power at all. 
let us, you know, get some irrefutable evidence that this is really there. And then let's think about what to do with it that's useful. Okay? So, um, you know, and, and uh, uh, we're at an especially exciting time uh, uh, right now. Maybe, you know, the most exciting time for quantum computing since I joined the field and since, you know, a lot of the basic concepts were discovered in the mid-90s because it's only now that the hardware is finally approaching the point where you know, it, it, uh, 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 the you know, most hard-headed uh, hardware designers are now talking to the most airy-fairy theorists like me and uh, saying, well, you know, what should we do with this, you know, this thing that we may have that is hard to simulate with a classical computer or that's interesting? And how do we know that it's hard to simulate? And how do we check that we really did it? Okay, and uh, so, so this is, um, you know, the, you know the, the next few years are going to be super exciting regardless of what happens. And, you know, my, uh, you know, I would, you know, give talks about this for several years and, you know, my, I would tend to sort of just bask in the uselessness of these just quantum supremacy demonstrations. Say so just even if they're completely useless for anything, right, who cares, you know, do people say, okay, yeah, sure, you found the Higgs boson, but, you know, how is it going to speed up financial portfolio optimization, right, you know, just people just, you know, they don't ask that kind of question, right, so, so you know, it, you know the, the fact that quantum computing could also be useful for this other stuff. I mean, that's a wonderful uh, cherry on the Sunday, but let's, you know, let's keep sight of the, of the, of the, of the big questions in front of us. Uh, now, uh, just within the last year, you know, I think we've started to realize that even the bare sort of NISC device that, uh, you know, would achieve quantum supremacy, it might already start to have some applications just in and of itself, even before going further. And that's a super interesting question, and I I'm going to tell you uh, uh, more about our, our current thinking about that in this talk. But um, uh, let me just start with, you know, why is uh, uh, quantum supremacy a non-trivial question for theorists? Right? I mean, we all know that it's a, you know, it's a huge, uh, uh, you know, a engineering challenge for, for the people building the systems who you heard from yesterday, right? But, uh, you know, some people say, well, well, you know, sure, it's really hard to build 100 qubits that are all integrated and that maintain a good fidelity, that maintain a long coherence time. But once you do, you know, oh, it's, it's completely clear that you get a speed up, right? Just throw them at whatever, you know, is your favorite application problem, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, airline scheduling or, or traffic flow or uh, 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 um, any of the other things that you heard about yesterday, right? And, you know, quantum computer, well, 100 qubits, that's two to the hundredth steps if you want to simulate it classically, right? Clearly an enormous speed up. Okay, well, the problem is, uh, you know, uh, in, 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 you know, I don't want to belabor it, but with quantum algorithms, we're always fighting not just against classical brute force, but against the fastest classical method that anyone uh, has ever thought of in, you know, more than half a century of uh, classical computer science. Okay, and classical algorithms can be very, very clever, just as quantum algorithms can be. Okay, they don't have to just do the obvious thing, you know, and, um, you know, and I think sometimes uh, uh, people kind of uh, 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 wave this issue aside by saying, okay, well, we just want to speed up. Now, we don't really care about a provable speed up, right? You know, it's those, those egghead theorists, you know, they care about proving a speed up and, you know, dotting all the I's. We just want us, you know, a speed up in practice. Okay, but I'm here to tell you that even if you just want to speed up in practice, you know, there's still, you know, you have to really, really think hard about it, about ruling out classical algorithms, not just as a, a matter of dotting I's, but as a real-world concern. Let me give you an example. So uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, my uh, uh, good friends and uh, colleagues, uh, Yordanis Karanidis and uh, Anupam Prakash, came up with a beautiful quantum algorithm uh, for recommendation systems, okay, for recommending products that a given user might want to buy in a, in a system like Netflix. Okay, so you imagine that you have this partial data about this huge matrix where the rows represent users and the columns products, and it's close to some matrix 
matrix of low rank. So you basically just have this linear algebra you know, matrix completion problem. And they showed how to use phase estimation, which is also the heart of Shor's factoring algorithm, to get an algorithm that you know, if your uh, data is stored in, a, in an appropriate data structure, that solves this in only logarithmic time which was exponentially faster than any quantum algorithm known at the time. Okay? And this was striking uh, because, um, first of all, you know, the, thi the one thing that the quantum algorithm could do, sample recommendations, you know, you know, you know, is actually the thing that you care about <laughs> for this application. And secondly, uh, you know, this was like a an application for quantum machine learning where people had someone had actually thought it through from end to end from classical input to classical output, and said for this real world task, we th you know, it looks like there's an exponential speed up. And that, that, was, that was really special. And so actually, uh, John you know, rightly called attention to it in his uh, keynote address at last year's Q2B. And, uh, uh, you know, so, uh, uh, and he and I and, and others tried to bring attention to it. Uh, you know, and I actually gave this problem to a bunch of students. I said, can you prove that there is any classical algorithm for the same problem would have to make, let's say, a polynomial, like let's say square root of n or linear in n number of queries to the data structure to solve the same task. So can we thereby prove that at least in this setting of counting the number of memory accesses that this quantum speed up is for real? Okay, and um, no, because this was a question that had been left open. You might say, oh yeah, yeah, it's kind of obvious, but you know, no one had proven it. So finally, I found a student, uh, Ewen Tang, who was actually a 17-year-old uh, who took my, who was in my undergrad class, uh, wanted to do a project. Uh, Ewen spent a year on this problem, trying one thing after another to rule out a classical algorithm. Was not able to do that. And eventually, discovered a deep obstruction to ruling it out. Okay, and that was that a fast classical algorithm exists. Uh, so, in other words, the quantum algorithm could be dequantized. Okay, there is a classical algorithm that generates the same outputs, you know, and whose running time is merely that of the quantum algorithm raised to the 33rd power, or something like that. Okay, now, 33, that, sounds, that actually sounds uh, kind of uh, big in practice, kind of impractical, but we're you know, very confident that this thing should run faster in uh, uh, practice than it could be guaranteed to run in theory. Okay, so at any rate, we, so we now see that uh, 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 qu quantum algorithms can at any rate give you at most a polynomial speed up for this problem and not an exponential one. Okay, and this has uh, very recently been generalized um, uh, just within the last month uh, by uh, 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 Ewen herself and uh, Seth Lloyd and Andres Gillian and by uh, three of my postdocs at UT Austin uh, independently. And they've basically shown that all of the quantum machine learning speed ups of the past decade that are based on doing linear algebra on low rank matrices, they can all be dequantized. Okay, so they can all be turned into classical, algor classical randomized algorithms. They're not ones that anyone had thought of before, but which are only, you know, which are inspired by the quantum algorithms, which are only polynomially slower than them. Okay, uh, you know, I think, you know, the, uh, it, it is still entirely possible that there will be real applications for quantum machine learning, in particular if you've heard of this HHL algorithm, Harrow, Hasidim, and Lloyd. I mean, that one um, can deal with high rank matrices and uh, it can, you know, it can even encode Shor's factoring algorithm, for example. So in full generality, that algorithm almost certainly will not be dequantized. Uh, but I think the challenge is now, you know, thrust upon us to find some real, you know, uh, go back to the drawing board and find some real world end-to-end -end applications for quantum machine learning where we can really get the kind of evidence we want that the quantum speed up is real and then it's going to survive the best attempts to dequantize it, to find a classical algorithm. Okay, now you can, pu you can put a positive spin on all of this. In fact, I was just at Microsoft recently. I talked to uh, Matthias Troyer and he said, well, look, you know, you know, you know, uh, you know we, we, we look at this on the bright side. For us, you know, this means that the applications of quantum machine learning are even more exciting than we thought, right? And they're so exciting that we can even realize them with zero qubits, okay? 
So, uh, so yeah, so, 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 so there is that, right? That just thinking in quantum terms, you know, can help us in the discovery of new classical algorithms. And actually you heard something about that in the, the Microsoft talk yesterday. Uh, but okay, but, but suppose that we want a real, you know, a bona fide uh, exponential quantum speed up and really demonstrate the necessity of a scalable quantum computer for something, right? Well, okay, so, so eventually, you know, in the, in the future of uh, uh, fault tolerant, you know, fully scalable quantum computers, you know, there are certain things like quantum simulations or of course Shor's algorithm, you know, breaking uh, uh, public key cryptography, where, you know, we are, we are very confident that the, an exponential quantum speed up is real, or rather, you know, either it is real or else there is, has to be a revolution in classical computer science, which, is just, which, which would be just as amazing as the quantum algorithm itself. Okay, so, uh, but what about in the near term? Okay, is there any clear, you know, separation between quantum and classical, any clear quantum supremacy that we can hope to demonstrate in the NISC era. Uh, and ideally, you know, we're, we're as confident as possible that the speed up is real, right? Let's just so, so let consider what happens if we focus exclusively on that goal, okay? We're totally fine with a useless problem as long as it is classically hard, okay? Well, what then? So, one of the uh, um, uh, uh, major realizations that uh, a bunch of people uh, have, a bunch of us have had over the past 15 years is that once you uh, look at quantum algorithms from this vantage point and you just say, where is the clearest, uh, uh, most unambiguous quantum speed up that I can find. Uh, there are a lot of advantages to switching our attention from let's say the traditional com computer science problems that would just have a single valid answer or a single objective function that you're trying to optimize. You know, like uh, uh, either you know, uh, uh, combinatorial optimization problems or like factoring or things like that to uh, sampling problems. That is, problems where the uh, desired output is a sample from a probability distribution. Okay, so there's not one right answer, right? There's, uh, you know, there's a whole distribution over answers that you're looking for, and you know, j testing whether the quantum computer is doing the correct thing or not will come down to a question of statistics come down to looking at the distribution over outputs and seeing, you know, does this have the right kind of signature, the right behavior, and uh, is that signature something that we could have reproduced classically, okay? So, um, uh, uh, so this really started with, uh, uh, I think, a, uh, a far ahead of its time paper of Terhal and DiVincenzo, uh, and then the sort of modern reincarnation of it uh, was done by uh, me and my student Alex Arkhipov when we formulated uh, this uh, 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 optical sampling proposal that uh, is called boson sampling, and uh, independently by Bremner, Joza, and Shepard, who had uh, 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 another model but with uh, some similar results about it. Okay, and um, so what did we uh, say in, the, uh, in these uh, papers? Uh, well, so, so we said, uh, you know, with very, very rudimentary quantum systems, so things that are, you know, don't even have to be universal quantum computers, or for that matter, even universal classical computers, okay? But uh, some very sort of simple quantum systems that, you know, actually seem pretty close to the, you know, natural physics of some systems you could imagine building in the lab. Uh, well, it's not clear how to get any definite answer with them that we couldn't get with a classical computer. But even if not, you could sample from some probability distribution over exponentially many different strings. So let's say over you know, the set of all n-bit strings, some non-uniform distribution in which some strings would be likelier than others, uh, where you know, it would be sampling would be easy for this quantum system, but uh, we, have, we can get very strong evidence that it would be intractable for a classical computer. In fact, we can say things like, if there were a fast classical algorithm that sampled from exactly the same distribution, then uh, the polynomial hierarchy would collapse. Okay, now, uh, for those of you who don't know what that means, you could take my word for it that it's bad. 
okay? But you know, if you've heard of the P versus NP problem, well, it would be sort of like P equals NP, except that we wouldn't feel the effects quite as much down here on Earth, okay? But like up in space, it would be just as cataclysmic. Okay, that's a way to think about it. Okay, it would be a huge collapse of complexity classes that we don't think are going to collapse. Uh, and now, you know, in, in the current state of theoretical computer science, this is about as well as we can ever do in arguing that real world problems are hard. Okay, by real world problems, I mean non-black box problems, right? So we're not counting memory accesses, but we're counting actual number of, of gates or, or steps. And, you know, and, and we can almost never just prove unconditionally that a thing is hard, because, you know, we can't even prove things like P is not equal to NP. But okay, you know, if we were physicists, we would just take these things to be laws of nature. So that, that's fine. You know, so, so the, the real question is, you know, if, if we're going to have to make some assumption, so which assumption? You know, is it a, a rock solid assumption? You know, like the polynomial hierarchy being infinite? You know, I, I'm going to, I take that as rock solid by, you know, by our standards. You know, or is it something that we just made up and that could, you know, uh, 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 you know, a minute ago, right? So, uh, so, so here we can really connect the hardness of simulating rudimentary quantum systems to some of the most basic uh, hardness conjectures that there are in complexity theory. Now, this doesn't yet quite work for approximate simulation, which is the sort of physically more relevant question. And that, I think, remains a major, major challenge for qu classical complexity theory to show you know, how we could establish those sorts of hardness results. Okay, but, uh, uh, but we do have some results there. And for exact hard, you know, sampling, we have very strong hardness results. Okay, and now a second huge advantage of these uh, 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 sampling tasks, you know, besides uh, um, uh, the, uh, 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 you know, the, the confidence, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that solving them will, you know, not merely collapse the world's economy or, you know, the world's e-commerce or whatever, but would actually collapse the polynomial hierarchy. Okay, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the other big advantage is that there's a real potential to implement some of these things using a NISC device. Uh, if you can, you know, it comes down to numbers. If you can get your qubits and your gates very, very accurate, then, uh, you know, it's quite possible that even with 50 to 100 qubits or 50 to 100 photons, let's say, in optical settings, you could realize some of these speed ups, conceivably even without uh, error correction. Okay, so, uh, so that, that's what sort of excited the experimentalists within the last decade. Uh, now, um, uh, the uh, conventional wisdom uh, until uh, uh, very recently was, well, you do give up on certain things. You give up on any obvious applications. And also, with these types of uh, sampling problems, uh, the only way that we know how to verify the results using our classical computers uh, itself takes exponential time. Right? So, you know, if they're n qubits, the verification takes two to the n time. So what does that mean? You know, and some people, like, they, they rediscover this, you know, as if, you know, no one ever thought of it. And they say, ah, this is like just a killer objection. Okay, but all it means is that these are uh, 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 demonstrations that are tailored to the NISC era of, you know, 50 or 60 or 70 qubits, where classical simulation would be difficult but not impossible. Right? So you could clearly see that your quantum computer was doing something many, many orders of magnitude faster than even, you know, a Hadoop cluster or, you know, some huge cluster of classical computers. Okay? But uh, the classical computers could also do the calculation in order to verify the result. Okay? So you would see that separation in, in, in running times. Okay, so let me now uh, uh, dig into uh, the uh, particular uh, uh, class of proposals that uh, the uh, uh, Google group in particular, you know, has been uh, 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 working toward implementing for the last uh, few years and that uh, I think uh, uh, s several other experimental groups are also uh, racing to try to implement. Okay, and this is, um, you know, you could think of it as like the degenerate case of a quantum speed up, okay? But all you'll do is, you know, you, you, let's say you 
build your NISC device, which might consist of some two-dimensional array of superconducting qubits on a chip. Let's say it's you know, square root of n by square root of n, where you know, n is of order 100. Uh, and now you just put some random sequence of quantum gates uh, on those qubits. Okay, so you just do like a random set of layers of, you know, of two qubit gates, uh, deep enough so that every qubit can influence every other one. And uh, then you take the resulting circuit, you apply it to some simple initial state, like the all zero state, uh, and you measure. And this gives you a sample from some distribution over n bit strings, depending on your circuit C. Right? And for the most part, this distribution will be a mess. Right? It just, will just look like a bunch of random garbage, but it's not completely uniformly random. Some output strings are likelier than others, you know, uh, on the scale of twice as likely, three times as likely, okay, because some of the final amplitudes have enjoyed constructive interference, while others have suffered destructive interference. Okay, in fact, the amplitudes themselves, uh, one can argue, are, are basically just Gaussian random variables, you know, of mean zero. Okay, so now you can just keep running the same circuit over and over again, uh, and it will give you a bunch of independent samples from your distribution. Okay, so now what do you do next? Now you have to check, were these samples actually reasonable draws? Are they consistent with my having sampled from this you know, classically hard distribution? Uh, well, um, to do that, the good news is that it does not require an exponential number of experiments. Okay? With just a very small number of samples, we can then do a calculation on our classical computer that says, what was the predicted probabilities of each of these outputs that I saw? And if I was correctly sampling, then the outputs I saw ought to be biased toward the likelier ones. Right? And, and if not, not. Right? So, and I can check that by you know, doing a, a, the exponential time classical computation to calculate what the amplitudes were supposed to be. I can see, you know, were these sort of heavy outputs? So, uh, so you know, we, you know, there are different ways to formalize this. Google has a way based on a measure that they uh, called cross entropy. Uh, we have a different way, uh, which is just about generating, you know, are enough of the, uh, uh, outputs, uh, you know, uh, do they have probabilities that's above some threshold? We call this prob task heavy output generation or hog. Okay? So we just check do the outputs solve the hog problem or not? Right? And whenever people come to us with complicated questions about, you know, well, how much noise can you, we tolerate in our system? And, you know, you know, and, 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 you know, here's our decoherence and blah, blah, blah. Right? We just say, all we care about is can you solve the hog problem or can't you? Right? It's like the Bell inequality in that sense. It's very clear cut. You either do the task or you don't. Okay? And then you publish your description of the circuit. And anyone you know, who believes that you didn't achieve quantum supremacy, whether you know, that's Gil Kalai, that's Diakonov, that's anyone else, they are welcome to use their classical computer and so show how they can generate the samples uh, just as fast. Okay? So uh, you, know, you do the same kind of thing that people do in applied cryptography, Just publish the challenge. Okay, so uh, if you want a picture, uh, so uh, uh, John Martinez likes to describe this in terms of speckle, right? So, uh, so imagine that you took a, a, sent a laser uh, uh, light through a ground glass, and then you looked at where the light could end up, there'd be certain likely spots where the uh, different paths constructively interfere, and also dark spots where there was destructive interference. And so you get a picture that looks like a mess, but you know, if you now saw a bunch of ran random samples of where this or that photon landed, then you could actually do some statistics. And you could say, it, are the places where these photons landed uh, correlated with the bright spots in this diagram? You know, if you had calculated what was the diagram. And in that way, you could quickly check whether your you know, quantum interference experiment was working as intended. Okay, so that's the basic idea. 
Uh, so um, in a paper uh, a year or two ago, uh, student uh, Lee Ji Chen and I uh, tried to prove some theorems about this situation, you know, the sort of the type of experiment that uh, the Google group is hoping to do with, let's say, its 72-qubit uh, bristlecone chip and that others may, may also try to do. Uh, uh, you know, and, and the, uh, our starting point was that, you know, we are theoretical computer scientists and we feel honor-bound to say, you know, something about, you know, the classical hardness of uh, solving this hog problem. You know, something a little more interesting than, you know, I don't know, seems hard to us. Okay? So, so, you know, so, so anything we can say is going to have to be conditional. We'll have to be based on some assumption, but can we say anything non-tautological? Okay, so we proved some hardness result for, you know, not merely for sampling from the same distribution that the uh, 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 NISC quantum device would be sampling from, but even for doing anything whatsoever that would pass the hog test. Okay, even if that thing, you know, vi uh, deviated from uh, uh, correct sampling and was only just trying to pass the test, you know, uh, in any way. Okay, and uh, admittedly, we had to make a strong and new hardness assumption, but our hardness assumption uh, does not talk about the hardness of sampling, right? It's, it's about the hardness of sort of an ordinary computational problem with a definite answer. And if you'll grant that that's hard, then we show that passing the hog test is also hard. So that's the basic upshot of this theorem. It says, you know, if there's a polynomial time classical algorithm that fakes the outputs of your NISC device, in other words, one that would take as input some random quantum circuit C with n qubits and m gates and that would solve hog with high probability, then there is also uh, an efficient classical algorithm that would guess like a particular output of your quantum circuit, whether it's large or small, say whether it exceeds some threshold, and it would just guess the answer, but its bias in guessing the right answer would be a little, little tiny bit better than we seems to be possible with any of the efficient classical simulation methods than we, the, that we know. Okay, so then, you know, we made a good faith effort to try to refute our own hardness assumption. Really, you know, I swear, honest, we did. Okay, and so, you know, and that, that forced us to look at sort of what are the best uh, general methods for simulating a quantum circuit classically. And this itself has been a topic of very timely interest as uh, groups at uh, IBM and Alibaba and Google and others have been uh, reporting record-breaking uh, classical simulations of quantum circuits. You know, and, and the better that they can do that, you know, the further that pushes out, you know, the threshold for quantum supremacy obviously. Okay, but um, so what we show is first of all there is a polynomial time classical algorithm to guess uh, uh, whether some probability in your quantum circuit, some output probability exceeds a threshold with bias uh, over random guessing that is 1 over exponential in M, M being the number of gates in your circuit. Okay, but uh, as far as we can see, not with bias 1 over exponential in n, n being the number of qubits. Okay? This is why it's important for us that the number of gates be large compared to the number of qubits. Okay? Uh, now, here's another interesting thing that we found. You know, and this could have been noticed much earlier, but it just seems to have been overlooked. Okay? You know, there are, you know, if you want to simulate a quantum circuit classically, there are sort of two obvious approaches. There's the Schrodinger approach, which is store the entire vector of 2 to the n amplitudes in your classical computer using a huge amount of memory, store the whole wave function, and then just do a bunch of matrix vector multiplies. Right? So that takes like 2 to the n time and 2 to the n space, let's say, if you've got n qubits. Okay? Now, a completely different approach is what I'll call the Feynman approach. Uh, and this is where you just calculate the amplitude you care about as a sum over all the possible contributions, over you know, all the paths that contribute to that amplitude. That takes only linear memory. It is way more memory efficient. But the time that it needs is exponential in m, the number of gates rather than, you know, and, and remember the number of gates could be thousands, you know, while the number of uh, qubits is only, you know, 50 to 100. Okay, so if you're, you know, 
you know, not, not, not even uh, uh, Microsoft or IBM or Google is going to be able to do two to the thousand, right? I mean, you know, in Google's case, I know that because it exceeds a Google, okay? But, you know, but, 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 they, but they can do two to the 50 with, uh, with, with effort, okay? So, um, so what we found is that it is possible to interpolate between the two and get an algorithm that uh, uses only li uh, linear memory and time that is nearly just an exponential in n, the number of qubits. Okay, it's like the depth of the circuit to the power of n. Uh, uh, so, uh, 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 the, you know, it's a divide and conquer recursive algorithm. Very simple, for some reason not noticed before, but, you know, I'm happy to say that in less, less than a year uh, after we published it, it's been incorporated by uh, uh, Alibaba and IBM and others in the state-of-the-art simulations of quantum circuits that they're doing that are, you know, setting the, I guess, the threshold that we're going to have to uh, exceed to get uh, the sampling-based quantum supremacy. Okay, but you know, having said that, uh, can you just go back one slide? Having said that, neither of those approaches seem to yield a guessing algorithm that would violate our hardness assumption. So for now, the hardness assumption remains uh, uh, standing. You know, uh, it's, uh, I welcome any of you to knock it down. Okay, so, um, okay, now, uh, as I was saying, you know, until very recently, you know, the standard line uh, on these sampling-based quantum supremacy proposals, certainly the line that I personally uh, would uh, promulgate, is that, uh, well, you know, even if these, you know, experiments work, obviously their output is going to be completely useless for any practical application, right? This is merely a starting, you know, this is merely just a race to the starting gate, right? It's a race to prove you know, the point of what is possible. Like, you know, it, it's not a nuclear explosion, it's a Fermi pile, right? It's a, you know, demonstration of what is possible that then sets the stage for looking for something useful. It can't be useful in itself because the output is just a whole bunch of random bits. You know, not uniformly random, but very, very nearly random. Right? You know, who needs a bunch of random bits? Okay, so now uh, a new realization, um, that uh, uh, I guess some of us have had uh, with recently within the last year. Uh, uh, so let me. So, so if you don't know what random bits look like, those are some random bits. I think I got them from random.org. Okay. Uh, uh, it's actually wait, wait. There's a site random.org. People use it. Hey, actually, maybe there are people who actually want random bits, and maybe that could be useful. Uh, so. Um, in particular, you know, there are many, many ways to generate bits that are plausibly random using, you know, interrupts, using uh, all kinds of nonlinearities and circuits and uh, all different types of physical hardware. And this is an extremely old problem going back to the very, very beginnings of computer science, right? How do you generate bits, you know, that are sort of random enough for applications, let's say, okay? But uh, the point I want to make is that if you want to use these random bits for cryptographic applications, uh, applications where there are adversaries, then the requirement is very stringent. Okay, that you, know, ev uh, uh, you may need to generate bits that you believe are random even if you don't trust the device. Okay, even if the device may have been, you know, built by your worst enemy, it may have been backdoored by, uh, you know, uh, 10 different intelligence agencies, okay, you would just like to say, as long as, you know, uh, my device passes some test that I can apply and that I can see for myself, then it has to be generating randomness. Okay, and that's a, a, a super hard task. You know, at first it even sounds like a philosophical impossibility. Okay, but wh why would we want that? Well, there's, you know, uh, two main uses. If you could generate bits that were certifiably random and that were known only to you, or only to you and your friend, let's say, then, uh, well, you could use those for cryptography. And you better have, you know, a secure randomness if you're going to do any cryptography. Okay, but there are also uses for public randomness, uh, random bits that would be published on the internet for all to see. One obvious use case could be a lottery, okay, or let's say choosing which precincts to audit in a close election. 
uh, another thing people think about, setting the parameters for uh, crypto systems. Um, cryptocurrencies, in particular the proof of stake cryptocurrencies that try to avoid you know, spending 1% uh, of the world's electricity to invert a hash function, you know, the way that Bitcoin does. Uh, they do require constantly running a lottery to decide who gets to add a new block to the blockchain. And that requires you know, a large source of randomness that everyone has to believe, trust really is random, even though there are huge uh, financial incentives to bias it. Okay, so uh, you know, you might say once we believe quantum mechanics, oh well, you know, my my my, my cat sign got knocked off. Uh, but you know, it, it's completely trivial to generate random bits. Just take some qubits in the zero state and measure them over and over in the Hadamard basis. Okay, well, the obvious problem with that is, well, you know, this this doesn't you know this doesn't defend against your hardware having been backdoored. Right, uh, because of the Snowden revelations, there was this big uh, upset a few years ago when we learned that uh, uh, a, uh, a pseudo-randomness standard uh, put out by NIST uh, almost certainly was backdoored in this way. And so, you know, there's, it's a real concern that people have. How do you get uh, 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 trusted randomness and know that it's not backdoored? Uh, NIST actually has a randomness beacon that every minute, I guess, releases 512 fresh random bits to the world. You can go to their website site and uh, try it out, uh, you know, and they are using uh, uh, quantum experiments and even Bell inequality violation, I think, you know, as of now, to help generate these random bits. But, you know, then the question arises, well, why should you believe that they implemented it correctly, you know, and that it was not backdoored by anyone, right, if you're just some user over the internet who, ha who has never visited their lab. Okay, so there was a, an, a, a very, very striking uh, approach to this problem uh, using quantum mechanics that was developed over the last decade. And uh, I'll call this Bell Certified Randomness Generation. And the idea here was to use the violation of the Bell inequality. You know, so the thing that proves that you know, quantum entanglement over long distances is a real phenomenon in our universe, right? The uh, famous uh, uh, Bell experiment, or you know, the CHSH game, as it's called. And uh, uh, people starting with uh, Kolbeck and others uh, around 2006 realized that uh, if you can do an experiment that violates the Bell inequality, this doesn't only prove the reality of entanglement, it does something more. It proves that unless there was instantaneous communication between your two separated devices, uh, the outputs that, that were generated must have had some entropy in them. They must have had some real randomness. Because if they didn't, then that would have given rise to a local hidden variable model for the experiment, which is exactly the thing that Bell's theorem rules out. Okay, so this was an amazing revelation to me, particularly because, you know, the Bell inequality is another thing that was treated for decades as just a prototype of uselessness, right? Obviously, it will have no application to anything. It just proves the point that our world is quantum. Same thing people said about quantum supremacy, right? But then they realized that, hey, you know, maybe it is useful for generating random bits, and we now know that it's useful for doing all sorts of other certification tasks as well. Uh, so, you know, the upside of this is it doesn't even require a quantum computer. It merely requires generating a bunch of entangled particles that can, you know, and using them to violate the Bell inequality, which can be done today. Okay, although having said that, if you really want to do it honestly, you need what's called a loophole-free Bell test. Okay, uh, one that's, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and these really uh, true loophole-free Bell tests were only achieved about two years ago. Okay, so this is current, albeit very, very recent technology. Um, now, the downside of the Bell approach is if you were getting these random bits over the internet, well, how on earth do you know that the two devices, the Alice and Bob, actually were separated, that they were unable to communicate with each other, which is the entire assumption that these schemes uh, all rely on. Okay, and so that's what leads us to the new idea, which is that one could also use a NISC-based quantum supremacy experiment as a way of generating these cryptographically certified random bits. 
Okay, so the picture that to have in mind is that we start with a small random seed, and again, the computer killed my D, but uh, uh, we uh, use that seed to pseudo-randomly, we mean, me, meaning a classical skeptic or verifier or client, use our seed to generate uh, a large number of challenges, okay, which take the form of quantum circuits. We then send those circuits one by one to a quantum computer, you know, according to Google Images, that's what a quantum computer looks like. And we ask, we demand that it uh, send back responses to our challenges within a very, each within a very short time. These responses being samples from the output distributions of each of our circuits. Okay? And then we uh, do something to try to verify the responses with our classical computer. And then uh, if they pass the verification, the key insight here is that, well, you know, there are tasks like this, you know, hog problem or, you know, sampling from these uh, 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 output distributions that, yes, a quantum computer can do them quickly and we can see it do them quickly, but under plausible computational assumptions, one can argue that even a quantum computer would only be able to uh, uh, pass these challenges by sampling the result randomly. Okay, so like if you had unlimited time, uh, yeah, you could just do a brute force search for a deterministic result that, the verif that would be accepted by the verification. Like maybe the first one in lexicographic ordering or something, okay? But not even a quantum computer is powerful enough to do that. Quantum computer is powerful enough to pass the test, but only via sampling a random answer. Okay? And so therefore, if the quantum computer passes the test and it does it quickly, then you know that there must be real randomness in the bits that it sent you. And you can then use those as a source of entropy. Okay, so um, you know, this requires just a single device. It's sort of ideal for near-term or NISC devices for reasons that we'll see. Um, it does require hardness assumptions and initial seed randomness. And we should be clear that with uh, my scheme, the verification uh, itself takes exponential time with a classical computer, okay? So like if this was with 50 qubits, verification takes two to the 50th time for the same reason, you know, as, as with any of these quantum uh, sampling-based quantum supremacy experiments, okay? And so again, you know, the goal is not to do something that's classically impossible. The goal is just to do something really fast with your quantum computer that you believe classically could only have been done much, much more slowly. Okay, and this is an idea that inherently requires quantum mechanics because if we try to imagine a classical solution to this problem, uh, well, you know, you could always just take whatever randomness source your classical device was using and you could swap it out for a pseudo-random generator and no one would be any the wiser. Okay, but this, you know, that uh, uh, step of swapping out the true randomness for pseudo-randomness is something that has no quantum analog, right? That doesn't work for quantum algorithms. And you could, in some sense, that is why this relies on quantum mechanics, this proposal. Okay, so, you know, indeed the protocol requires certain tasks finding the heavy outputs of your circuit to be hard for a quantum computer, uh, sorry, to, sorry, to be easy for a quantum computer, even while other tasks finding the same heavy outputs uh, every time uh, are hard. Okay, uh, so, you know, I have more detail about the protocol, but because I'm running out of time, uh, you know, and, you know, as the paper, like many of my papers, is uh, not quite written yet, but I promise it'll be out soon, you know, and there's some soundness analysis, you, have, you do have to make a strong computational assumption for all this to work, even stronger than Ligi and I had to make for the basic quantum supremacy experiment, but, you know, it looks like a plausible assumption, and if the assumption holds, then I can argue that each round of this protocol really is giving you some, you know, li linear number of bits of fresh entropy called min entropy. And you can then feed that into a well-known classical tool called a, a randomness extractor in order to get nearly perfect random bits, which you could then use for cryptographic applications. Okay, so, you know, it could be used either for private randomness or for public randomness. Um, I should mention that even, you know, while you do need a pseudo-random generator, even if the 
uh, generator were to be broken later, as, uh, as long as it's not broken now, your random bits remain OK, which is called forward secrecy. And the, and the scheme has several other properties that uh, could be desirable to cryptographers. OK, uh, I should also mention there was a completely different approach to the same task uh, of generating certified random bits with a quantum computer, which uh, uh, was in a beautiful recent paper of Brikersky et al. Uh, their approach, I think, is theoretically superior to mine. It relies on some very high-powered classical cryptography, uh, lattice-based cryptography. Uh, uh, very, very clever. And unlike me, they actually give a polynomial time classical algorithm for verifying the outputs. So they give a fast classical method to verify that the bits that you generate really are random. Okay? So the remaining advantage of my scheme is mostly that mine is the one where there is some hope of realizing it with a NISC device. Uh, you know, with theirs, I think you would need, you know, at the very least, on the order of 1,000 qubits uh, before it became practical. Okay. So uh, there's lots of exciting future directions here. Uh, for example, uh, an obvious one, can we prove quantum supremacy as well as certified randomness generation under more standard and less boutique computational hardness assumptions? Let's say merely the polynomial hierarchy being infinite, something like that. Uh, can we get efficient classical verification, like Rikersky et al. got, but also get it with a NISC device. You know, that's an obvious challenge that's come up again and again. I would love to be able to address it. Can we get more and more certified randomness by sampling with the same circuit over and over? I'm told by the uh, uh, experimentalists that that would enormously improve the bit rate if we could do that. Uh, so conclusions, we might be close to quantum supremacy experiments with you know, 50 to 70 qubits, might or might not. Uh, we, today, we can say interesting things about the hardness of simulating these experiments classically. We'd love to be able to say more. Certified randomness generation is maybe not the most exciting application of a quantum computer that's ever been thought of, but it might actually be the first one to become technically feasible because you pretty much just need sampling-based quantum supremacy, right? You just need a NISC machine that can pass a test like the Hogg test, and as soon as you've got that, then you can get this application. Okay, the application requires sampling problems. Problems with definite answers are useless for it. And it's not just that you can do it with order 60 or 70 qubits, it's that you don't even want more than that. Because with too many qubits, you, couldn't even you wouldn't even be able to verify the answers classically. So I feel like this is kind of in this ironic uh, uh, space where we've just, uh, you know, uh, uh, instead of just trying to ignore the weaknesses of NISC quantum computers, we embrace them and we try to turn them into strengths. Okay, so thanks for listening. I don't know if there's time for questions or not. Yeah. Hi, Scott. Uh, thanks yeah. for the great talk, as usual. Um, just a, a bit of a technical question. So yeah. do your results apply also for different models that cannot be simulated classically and this point hierarchy collapses, like say IQP circuits, like mm -hmm. Boston sampling, do they yeah. carry over? Or is uh -huh. there something technical about random quantum circuits? That, 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 uh, that's an excellent question. So certainly I thought about that. I believe that, uh, uh, um, uh, so, so, the, so, the, so the first uh, uh, result, like the thing with Li Ji Chen, uh, for you know, that style of hardness argument really requires some parameter M that you can, you know, representing like the number of gates that you can increase past N, the number of qubits, right? And uh, IQP and boson sampling actually don't have that property, okay? So we have other ways to argue the classical hardness of IQP and boson sampling, right? But that, this particular way of arguing it really does seem to be special to something like, a, you know, a general quantum circuit. Okay, uh, for the randomness generation, um, also there are, um, uh, I think that it would work for IQP, okay, but now there are particular uh, uh, things I use in the analysis, like I use the assumption that you cannot, you know, even guess like whether a given output probability is large or small a little bit better than chance. Right, and, uh, uh, and that is, uh, we think, true for random circuits, but that's provably not true for boson sampling, 
right? Well, Arkhipov and I have a paper showing that it's false for, 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 uh, for, for boson sampling. Uh, now, I, I, think, I still think that with boson sampling or with pretty much any of these proposals, yeah, it should work. You should be able to generate cryptographically certified random bits. You know, however, showing that would require a new analysis beyond the analysis that I'm doing in this paper that I'm writing. So, you know, more, 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 more papers and more, you know, that just means more, more work to keep me and my friends busy in the future. Yeah. I'm not sure if you can answer this without a blackboard, but if it's uh, not possible, we'll just skip it. But at the beginning, you talked about polynomial hierarchy. Yeah. Um, being infinite, yes. maybe I'm just broadcasting my naivety of, yeah. the, of the sector. Yeah. That's a new concept to me, and, and it okay. collapses. Uh, Is that possible to explain in a... In a uh, yeah, let me try. So, okay, so the polynomial hierarchy is a generalization of P and NP, right? So the most famous question in computer science is whether P equals NP. Uh, have you, sorry, the questioner, have you, have you, you've heard of that one? Okay, good, so good, because the, 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 we're, we're gonna start there, right? So, uh, so uh, P is the zeroth level of the polynomial hierarchy. NP is the first level, right? So, and, and, and the, uh, we uh, define the levels by how many quantifiers you're allowed to have. So like with NP, you can say, do there, is, is there a setting of these variables that satisfies these constraints? Right, so that's one quantifier, say an existential quantifier, okay? But you could also imagine, and in computer science, in practice, there often arise uh, statements with two quantifiers. Like maybe you wanna know, is there a setting of these variables such that for every setting of those variables, my constraint is satisfied, right? Th yeah, that's two. Those types of problems sometimes show up. Questions of that form will, will lie in the second level of the polynomial hierarchy, right? If we ask, is there a setting of these variables such that for every setting of those variables, there is a setting of these variables, and so forth, then that's the third level, and so forth, okay? And so a fundamental conjecture in computer science, going back to the early 1970s, is that each extra quantifier lets you express things that could not be expressed before. Okay, and that's the statement that the polynomial hierarchy is infinite. Okay, so now the, the most uh, catastrophic collapse would be if P equals NP. And then the entire thing would come crashing down to the zeroth level. Okay, but you know, you could also imagine, well maybe it only collapsed at the 17th level, you know, and, and no further than that. You know, that's really, sh most of us think that, that that would be pretty strange. And you know, and, and uh, based on long experience, you know, of you know, it, the thing not collapsing, we just tend to conjecture, yeah, it's probably infinite. That's a, a strengthening. I think of it as maybe only a modest strengthening, but it's a strengthening of the fundamental hypothesis of P is not equal to NP. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, Scott. Mm -hmm. uh, amazing content, as always. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for having me.